Flutter. Uh, we're going to do a case study. We're going to talk about how you risk stratify patients for immediate stroke and then also how we prevent stroke in the long term and uh, finish up with some take-home messages. So we know we define recent onset atrial fibrillar flutter are uh, symptomatic episodes where cardioversion is still an option, can be first detected or recurrent, doesn't matter. Typically onset less than 48 hours, but it could be up to seven days if they're anticoagulated. And as you know, uh, uh, some folks, uh, particularly in the U.S., uh, just like to do rate control. Canada, uh, certainly uh, much, uh, most eMERGE docs in, in Canada would attempt to convert the patient back to sinus rhythm. Uh, and we've already heard how there's equipoise, whether you give drug first, you just go straight to shock. But we all know, and we can't forget, that uh, it's, uh, uh, we do not want to cause or have our patients suffer a stroke. So let's do this case study here. 67-year-old guy had sudden onset of palpitations six hours before, feels weak, but no chest pain or dyspnea, no prior history of arrhythmia or other cardiac disease. Overall, pretty well. He's on aspirin and statin. His heart rate's 140, the vitals are otherwise decent. His ECG shows rapid atrial fibrillation, no tricks. Uh, so we give him procainamide quickly, over 30 minutes. And of course, he converts to normal sinus rhythm. So what is this patient's uh, CHADS 2 risk score? 0, 1, 2, or 3. Should I pick on somebody, maybe one of the older doctors, just embarrass them? No, I won't do that. But his CHADS 2 score is zero. Okay, well, that's nice. So we cardioverted this guy with procainamide. Now, according to the new guidelines, what do we have to do to ensure that he is uh, optimally uh, safe in terms of preventing a stroke? What is it we have to do? So here's a bunch of choices. Should we have given him heparin and put him on oral anticoagulants, uh, low molecular weight heparin and oral, oral anticoagulant, aspirin only, do nothing. So according to guidelines, what is the right answer there? And uh, the answer is that one. And why should we put a guy with CHADS 2 score of 0 on oral anticoagulants? It's because the CHADS 2 score is now obsolete, and uh, they have revised it. They're calling it, or I'm calling it CHADS 65, which just means it's the same CHADS 2 score, but they've dropped the age from 75 to 65. Uh, so this patient is 67, so he has a score of 1, and our job is to start him on oral anticoagulants or... Uh, if you really don't want to do that, is to make sure that somebody else sees them quickly uh, to start them on an oral anticoagulant. So the big paradigm shift now is the cardiologists on the panel, and there was about 20 of them, think that there's a much lower threshold to start oral anticoagulants and that it's, the burden is on us <coughs> to get the ball rolling. Uh, okay, so next question. When oral anticoagulants are indicated, Novel OACs are preferred over warfarin, true or false? And this is again according to the guidelines and the cardiologists. And the answer is true. They seem to think there's all kinds of advantages to novel OACs. They have, uh, they don't need uh, INR monitoring. Uh, some of them are once a day. Uh, and uh, they take effect immediately. So that's the beauty of them is, uh, is that they, the patient is covered very, very quickly after they start uh, taking them. Uh, lots of issues for eMERGE docs in that um, we're not that comfortable prescribing uh, uh, NOAX, so uh, I think um, we need to learn how to do it. Uh, it's not that tricky. I've done it. <laughs> um, there is a problem of cost. They're fairly expensive. Uh, and at present time in most provinces in Canada, uh, to be covered, a patient has to be in some weird situation where they cannot have INR monitoring or they have to um, have tried warfarin for at least two months and found it didn't work. So uh, that is the, the challenge to everybody. Um, so we're being encouraged to use novels, but you may have to just stick with warfarin depending on all kinds of circumstances, whether the patient has insurance or 
or whatever. Uh, and now we'll just uh, look through the algorithm uh, that uh, breaks the patients down into different categories. So we want to risk stratify when somebody comes into the ED. And um, so obviously you're taught right away, is the patient stable or unstable? So that's always number one. Uh, and what do we call unstable is like they're in shock. Their blood pressure is quite low. Their uh, obvious ischemia with chest pain and, and ST changes, or uh, they're in florid pulmonary edema. That's not very common for recent onset atrial FIB. I'll come back to that. So then what is their uh, risk for stroke? And uh, we have your classic low risk, clear onset less than 48 hours, or they're already on an anticoagulant, in which case they're covered. High risk. If they're not on anticoagulants or their INR is subtherapeutic uh, uh, and they have onset over uh, 48 hours or you don't know, they've had a recent stroke or they have valvular heart disease, uh, which is defined as mechanical heart valve or rheumatic uh, valvular disease. Uh, and this is what you do with them. And we'll come back to each group. So don't try to read this too closely. Obviously, first thing you want to do is assess your patient. We've talked about deciding, stratifying them by whether they're stable or not. And the vast majority, 99% of these folks are stable. Uh, history is all important, and I think we all know to really try to tease out whether the onset was within 48 hours. And we know that older folks, um, uh, sometimes I don't even know they're in a rapid rhythm. They just feel kind of weak, and it's very difficult to, uh, to time the onset. I'd say uh, uh, that so there are older patients that have a heart rate of 150, and we don't know when it started, so you have to be careful with them. Most other people don't know exactly when it started. And most of them don't wait 48 hours. Most of the time, if it's the first time anyway, they come in uh, much sooner than that. Uh, are they anticoagulated? Uh, what's their INR, and uh, have they had it before? And as you know, many of these patients are repeaters, and they have their own personal opinion about what's going to work best for them. And those are the ones we have to work a little harder on with the study to convince them that to give one or the other treatment a chance. So let's look at the low-risk patients. Uh, how are we going to prevent stroke in these people? Uh, so they're allowed to be cardioverted. We do not have to give them anticoagulation or heparin before or, or while they're in the ED. Um, and these are the drugs, but the only drug that we really use in Ottawa is, is procainamide because it is uh, as effective or more effective than anything, and it's relatively safe. And being IV, it's faster by a long shot than uh, oral agents. Uh, when we send the patient home, the yellow box, then uh, if the what they're calling the CCS algorithm, I prefer to call it CHAD65 because a lot easier to remember, is one or higher, then you should start OAC. If they don't have a, a CHAD's a score of one or not, but they've had a MI or they've had a vascular disease, then you should start them on aspirin. Otherwise, you don't have to do anything. But it is certainly, uh, if you're starting uh, OAC, it's uh, certainly a good idea to have our early uh, expert follow-up with a cardiologist or internist to, to, to re review the case and, and ensure that, that they're kept on this on the long term because it's often a, uh, a long-term uh, proposition. Uh, so this is the CHAD65 algorithm. Um, if you read the paper, it's, they like to call it the CCS algorithm. I think this is a lot easier. So basically, anybody 65 or older is going to need OAC. Uh, and the other criteria are from the CHAD score. And you don't have to remember if it's one or two, just that it's there. If no, uh, coronary artery disease, arterial disease, or aspirin, otherwise nothing. So if you just think 65, that uh, that, that will uh, clarify right up front uh, for a lot of folks. Uh, so what if somebody like was on a, you know, journal club, they went out drinking afterwards, come in with atrial fib, uh, do we have to start them on uh, anticoagulants after converting them? No, we don't, unless, because uh, uh, most of you are not over 65. Most of you. So uh, I think 
we're all going to have to get used to uh, at least learning one uh, novel oral anticoagulant and um, you don't want the patient to be at risk for bleeding so for the most part uh, they should stop antiplatelet agents except for uh, uh, they have recent ACS or on stents um, and then they have to have their blood pressure treated, cut down the alcohol, improve INR control. Um, NOACs uh, are generally pretty safe, but you have to be concerned if they're elderly or have a diminished uh, renal function. And um, the drug companies are, you know, there's three of these on the market and one more are coming very shortly. Uh, so there'll be four of them to kind of choose amongst. And I think most doctors, uh, that aren't cardiologists uh, probably should just kind of figure out one and get used to it. And uh, Kathy, you probably have more experience than anybody in prescribing this uh, in your office. Do you prescribe a bunch of them or you just stick to one that you like? whether they can afford it and all these things are factors, right? Okay. Uh, okay, let's look at the high risk patients then. So these are the ones you cannot normally cardiovert because they have inadequate or no oral anticoagulation. Onset was uh, over 48 hours. They've had a recent stroke or they have valvular heart disease. So you really, uh, you gotta slow them down, but you have two options. One is to slow them down, send them home on an oral anticoagulant for at least three weeks at which time they can be cardioverted or if it's during the daytime and you're in a place with uh, lots of cardiologists hanging around you can get a transesophageal uh, echo to then uh, allow you to do a cardioversion uh, that that very day slowing down drugs uh, diltaniazem uh, seems to be the most effective metoprolol is another reasonable option but the point is if you slow them down with IV, you have to send them home on an oral formulation. There's no point in just slowing them down for a couple of hours. And you should ensure that their heart rate is down before you send them home. You know, you don't want to just see it dip below 100 once. Um, you need to get them up and have them walk around a little bit and make sure the heart rate isn't already right back up to 150 before they go home. <clears throat> so the yellow boxes, again, is pretty much the same idea uh, except uh, it, you have to start the ones uh, you have to start them on oral agent uh, in either way so even if you don't cardiovert them and you want them to be you have to start them on an agent or if you do uh, an echo it's normal you shock them cardiovert them you have to start them on something and they prefer you to start that person on a NOAC because of the instant uh, onset that warfarin, as we know, is slower. So they'd rather, uh, you could start them on uh, warfarin, but you have to then cover them with hep, uh, low molecular weight heparin. So in that case, a NOAC uh, for a while is the safest and easiest route. Uh, but as I said, uh, some patients can't take NOAC and then you're stuck with warfarin. Uh, this is a useful tool. I, it's not often used, I've noticed, but um, certainly if I have a patient you know, the INR is kind of not so great, or the onset is getting up towards 48 hours or is unknown, I, I will ask, call the echo lab directly. Don't talk to CCU resin, he's not gonna help you. Call the, C the echo lab directly uh, at the Civic. I am not too sure you could get this at the general. So at least at the Civic, you just call the lab and they will bring the patient over and do an echo and uh, rule out a clot. Then you can go ahead and get procainamide or cardiovert uh, the patient. So I've done this like a zillion times and uh, find it's quite helpful. Now you have to get the patient on a NOAC uh, afterwards. Uh, unstable patients. So this is important to talk about. Um, and if you just follow ACLS, uh, and simplify your life, unstable patient, cardiovert immediately. Well, that could be totally the wrong thing to do and you can end up causing a lot of harm if you just rush in and shock a patient with a rapid AFib who's got a blood pressure of 60. Um, and why is that? Because it's not that common that recent onset AFib causes 
somebody to be unstable. It's much more common that somebody with permanent a AF also has something else going on, like heart failure, ischemia, uh, hypotension due to sepsis or bleeding or something else. So if they're in permanent AF and you sedate the guy and shock him, it's not going to work. And having laid him down and sedated him isn't really going to help his uh, hemodynamics. So this is something you have to be super careful with. And it can be a challenge. Uh, and you have to look for clues, look through the chart for old ECGs. Is the patient already on an oral anticoagulant, which suggests that, you know, most of them are on an anticoagulant long term. So that's a clue that they have permanent AF. So you have to think carefully uh, before you... Uh, run in and shock them, uh, and certainly the cardiologists think that you may be able to just deal with the AFib just by uh, rate control and then getting at the underlying uh, condition. If this is truly a new onset, then for sure, uh, um, and you have to shock them, then you obviously need to start them on oral anticoagulants as well. So there's the whole picture all together. And uh, I will uh, send around by email the, the, the guidelines that uh, everybody asks uh, sometime the next day or so. Uh, so when you're getting ready to send somebody home, uh, there's a few things you got to think about. Be sure and arrange follow-up, if, especially if it's the first episode. Uh, in Ottawa, we typically send them to a cardiologist. Uh, internists in a smaller centers can handle this easily. Uh, usually, if it's the first episode, they should have a, an echo arranged to see if there's some structural heart disease that's contributing or valvular problem. Uh, so... Don't forget your thromboembolic prophylaxis. Uh, CHAD 65, uh, one or greater, you should start NOAC or warfarin. Coronary artery disease or vascular disease, start aspirin. Uh, if it's warfarin, please arrange for monitoring, and that's a nuisance, but we got to do it. Uh, and we do not prescribe long-term antiarrhythmics because uh, they're not all that effective and some are dangerous, so we leave that up to the uh, cardiologist to do. So take home messages, please, uh, we see these patients all the time and it's very satisfying to get them back in sinus rhythm, but please don't uh, leave them at risk for a stroke. Uh, you want to stratify their immediate risk. TEE is a useful tool during the, the weekday. Uh, don't forget to start OACs or aspirin and arrange early follow-up. So I'll stop there and take questions. Thanks very much.